Well, good afternoon, Peter. Um, it's uh, it's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon here in the Philippines and in Australia. Peter and I are on the same um, uh, on the same time zone, uh, so it's my great pleasure to to welcome Flight Sergeant Peter McCabe, who's a DMM MFC. Um, Peter was a technician in the Rhodesian Air Force during the Bush War, and has a very interesting story to tell. Uh, so, Peter, without further ado, brother, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about your background, um, you know, like where you were born and grew up and went to school and how you ended up in the Air Force. Hi, John. Um, yeah, I was uh, born in Salisbury, like everybody else. Uh, and um, my my father was a road maker. So when I was born, we went out into the bush and we just followed the road camps as he went along. Um, when I was five, I went to a Snoya Junior School. Uh, for, for KG1, KG2, and then my parents uh, separated, and I went back to Salisbury with my mother, and we stayed in um, in Braceside, Nettleton Road, opposite the Nettleton School, and I, I continued my schooling at Nettleton Junior. My my eldest half brother, my mother's first son, he boarded with us, and uh, he's much older than me, and um, <coughs> he basically uh, um, was my mentor. Uh, he did, he was a, a, a mechanic at Leyland Albion. He'd done his apprenticeship in the UK and he, he taught me tools and how to fix motors and cars and, and motorbikes, et cetera, et cetera. But um, he was an, an, an ex Alan Wilson boy and an Ali Willie old boy. So he managed to get me into Alan Wilson. And I, I started Alan Wilson in 1961. And uh, my elder brother, Frank, uh, he was uh, one of the first pupils at, at Snoyer High School. And he went basically all the way through there to Form 4 when he came to Cranbourne High School. And he's one of the few guys that actually joined the SAS straight from school. He did the selection course um, as, as, a, as a high school student. And he passed. He was on the same course as Bundy Tithers, Hattie Hatfield, et cetera, et cetera. So in 1965, he basically left the nest and went to the, the SAS. And then in 1965, in December, I applied to join the Rhodesian Air Force because I'd had enough of, uh, of schooling, basically. So um, I uh, applied to join in, in December. Well, I, I went to the selection course in December of 65. This after UDI was declared. I just turned 17. I had my 17th birthday in November. And uh, just going through my forms here that I was invited to join with, just to let you know, a few of the guys I went with are um, uh, Ted Lunt, uh, uh, Dave Boyce, Alan Cutler, um, uh, where are we? Uh, Brian Penton, Brian Nickel, and um, those were the few of the guys that were on the course with me when we, we did our selection. I passed them all the selection, and then they turned around the Air Force uh, uh, boffins that were there. They said, you, You've passed, but you're actually too young to be a pilot. You're only 17. So we've got an offer for you. So they said, If you join up on, on the technical side on in the next upcoming course, which is number 20 course in January, we'll allow you to reapply next year and we will um, see how you go for pilot selection in 1966. So I said, well, well obviously these, these guys are true to their words. So I joined up and uh, on the um, uh, 26th of January, 1966, I joined the Air Force on num number 20 course. We had um, a total of 25 people. Um, we had uh, a radio course, an instrument course, airframes, and an armament course. And we had one extra guy who joined us was Headley Giles. Um, I don't know if you know Headley, um, but uh, he was uh, he joined us as a photographer. And uh, he's a very good Rhodesian golfer. He played golf for Rhodesia, I think, more than he worked in the Air Force. But uh, he was uh, he, he joined our course, and we, we did our basic um, uh, joining Air Force stuff which is learning how to drill and march and learning the Air Force way of doing things. And um, this was all at New Serum. And um, we were in our four, four squads, basically, because each section had a squad. And we were with 19 course. They were the, the course before us. They were the old boys. We were the new boys. And um, having listened to some of your interviews with the Brown Jobs and um, even the um, Air Force cadets, we had it very, very easy. Um, each um a student as we call them had their own room you had uh, an inspection on a friday morning so on thursday evening you would uh, you, you'd polish the floors and just to make sure that the floors were shiny enough 
you change the um, the regulation to 40 watt bulbs in in, in the roof of the uh, of the, of the barrack room to 100 watts. So they really shone. You know? So it just really <laughs> made a, a good impression. You know? And um, we had Bob Harris was our PTI DI, and he lived off base, and um, he used to have to get in there at six every morning. And um, in this, especially in, in the winter time, you, you could hear him coming around the ring road on his matchless 500 cc single cylinder motorcycle, and you could hear this as he turned off at the radar tower, saw the airport, and came all the way around the ring road. So for some reason, we were always on 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 the side of the parade square in squads when he arrived on his bike. So he was pretty impressed, but it was fairly easy stuff. <laughs> and then um, just we were basically introduced to the admin of the air force and who's who in the zoo, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, who's the boss and, and we were right down the bottom so there wasn't a question about that but um, they introduced us to all the Air Force admin stuff and your leave forms and the charge forms and your ID forms and um, they did this. one of the odd ones that I, I could never get my head around was a conversion voucher they used to have um, demand vouchers return vouchers and a conversion voucher if you wanted a, a new engine for your aircraft you demanded a new aircraft, a new engine, and they supplied you one and you returned the old one on a return voucher. So all the papers balanced with this conversion thing he had me going. But old chief, he came around, he said, it's very simple. He said, um, if, if you look at it this way, in, in the Second World War, if um, a, um, a Sunderland flying boat uh, squadron lost an aircraft and it wasn't actually written off as war damage, um, you'd uh, put the Sunderland in on a, a, a conversion voucher. You put it down as a boats flying Sunderland for the use of, and you would convert it to a boats tender aircraft for the use of. And then you would then uh, throw in another conversion voucher for a boats tender aircraft for the use of, to a boats gravy dining for the use of. And then you'd go to somebody's mess, you'd, you'd pinch a, a gravy boat, and, um, and that would be returned to stores. So, um, <laughs> So, so the book's balanced. <laughs> I said the book's balanced, yeah. So uh, after six weeks, we were broken up into our trades. Um, there were six of us in radio, six armaments, six airframes, and six instruments. Um, and instruments was, uh, was Steve Murray. As you know, he, um, he went to fly hunters because uh, his first posting, in fact, was to Thornhill. He, he didn't tell you in his interview. But um, he was on the uh, um, technician on the hunter simulator, and he could actually outfly anybody on the simulator. Sure. That's so he was he was basically asked to apply to be a pilot. He was he's a very good pilot. He actually lives here in Perth as well. I called him a little while ago. And um, uh, as I say, our in, in, instructor was was Sergeant Ken Humphreys. Uh, now, in, uh, prior to 1966, um, all the radio trades were trained at Halton in the UK, either Halton or Cranwell in the UK. So this was the first basic uh, local radio course. And, uh, and Ken Humphreys had just been grabbed from the section and said, right, you know, an instructor. And we um, worked on the AP3302. There were three volumes. And he just basically read the book. We read the book. And uh, we were trained as, as radio people. And... Um, the, um, one of the interesting things about the AP3302, it's a, a very good publication for the Royal Air Force, but they mentioned in there that um, they had a, about a, two paragraphs on semiconductors. And they said, these um, uh, devices are too fragile for aircraft use, so we weren't even bother, uh, talking about them. So everything was valves, and uh, we were trained on valves, you know, the old radio tubes. And uh, after having done our, our six months in training school, we were all farmed out to, um, to all, the, all the squadrons. Half the people went to Fawn Hill, half stayed at New Serum. And uh, I was um, transferred to um, the ground radio section because I had a bit of a speech impediment. And um, they said that wouldn't go down well when you're trying to talk to the tower, basically. So um, I, got, I got that sorted out. One of the dukes. And um, that went away, except for every now and then I have the odd word that I battle with. But um, posted to the ground radio section. Now, the difference between ground and air is that um, ground radio is point to point communications, and air radio is, as it stands for, all the aircraft radio stuff. And my first posting was to receivers, and um, the um, uh, receivers were right at the, the start of, uh, of 06 runway, and the transmitter station was right around uh, the other end of the runway um, by the Salisbury Beacon. 
and you basically kept the higher power transmitter away from receivers so it wouldn't uh, affect your point to point communications. And we had um, point to point communications twice a day with Gibraltar. We used to speak to the Royal Air Force uh, twice a day just um, to say hello and goodbye, we're still here. And then um, after uh, initial uh, receivers, which wasn't too bad, I was issued with a, um, a matchless 500 CC motorcycle that I, I used to ride down the ferry track and then go to receivers and come back in the evening. From there, I was moved to transmitter station and um, the receivers, there was only two of us, transmitter station, there were larger, there were six people there. And um, while I was at transmitters, um, that's when they had the, the the fearless talks with HMS Fearless, basically. Yeah, so I was, in, I was involved in the uh, in the fearless talks where we um, had communication through Gibraltar with the HMS Fearless and Ian Smith was on there and we did all the comms basically for the um, for the talks. Um, Barney Coleman, our warrant officer in charge, he was actually given one of the first um, MSCs um, that were issued even before the GSM was issued. So Barney Coleman got himself an MSC out of that. And then from there, I went to the IS hangar, which is the internal security radio hangar, where all the forward airfield gear was. Um, and we had uh, basically four lots of equipment. One was for the forward airfield, which was um, two tents, um, tables, chairs, all the gear to support four people, plus valve radios and a petrol generator. So you had the HSI 21 uh, four-channel HF SSB and the Pi Cambridge three-channel VHF with antennas, etc. So those were immovable. And um, if they had, had to go out, the radios were in uh, plywood boxes and you'd go off and you'd uh, set up a FAF, as in Ford Airfield. Um, then we had the Hufflinger Stapo, the little um, uh, four-wheel drive vehicle that was a 600cc. It had uh, half a VW motor, 600cc air-cooled, and that thing could go anywhere. And you could transport two of them in a DC-3 Dakota. And those had um, SMD 422B HF radios, four-channel, they had two of those, and two Pi Vanguards, which uh, are VHS sets. And uh, we also had Land Rovers with exactly the same gear on, as I said, we were camping. And um, you learn to maintain the gear, make sure that all the rations are up to date, and there was petrol for the generators, et cetera, et cetera. So after six months there, we were um, sent back to ground training school to do our SAC course, because we were initially um, aircraftsmen untrained, and then we were aircraftsmen, and now we were going to be senior aircraftsmen. And um, we were there with um, 19 cores that passed on and 18 cores had come back in. And, and they were the old boys and we were the new boys still. And um, our instructor at this stage was an old guy called Basil Connellan. Uh, Baz was, um, he, he'd actually been a radio technician in Civil Street and he joined the Air Force. And um, he, he taught us a hell of a lot about actually repairing radios rather than just reading books. And then um, after another six months there, we, we graduated as SACs. And I don't know if you know the, the rank uh, badge for the SAC is the three-bladed propeller which you wore on, um, on your sleeve. And uh, one of the things was you went downtown and you always said you were a helicopter pilot, you know, three blades. However, it's, uh, it's one of those little stories. From there, I was uh, transferred um, at the end of the course, the guys were sent out again. And um, I was sent to IS Radio. And uh, from there, um, we'd had uh, gifts from the South Africans. We had... Uh, we were given uh, TAC-14 and TAC-13 communications vehicles. I don't know if you've ever seen them, John. They were big um, Ford control Land Rovers. Sure. They, yeah. um, it was a, a standard Land Rover chassis, uh, except the driver sat over the front wheel, and it had a very snub nose. If you have a look in my notes there, um, and then the Air Force phase, there's some pictures of them in there. And um, the, those uh, vehicles, they had a 1,000-watt single uh, independent sideband transmitter with um, HF receivers and exciter units plus uh, VHF and uh, 40 meg FM for point-to-point -point communication between vehicles. And they also gave us a thing called an Argo beacon, which was a trailer that had um, a, a, a 24 stack half-wave dipole antenna that rotated on the top. And what you basically did was you put this in a place and you set it up and started going and 
basically, as it uh, wound around, there was a lovely Swedish lady's voice that called out all the uh, um, uh, the compass points and coordinates every five degrees as it rotated around. So it was actually sending out a, a beam of radio. So if you happened to be flying along and um, you heard this voice saying 032, you knew if you turned to 032, you, um, you'd fly directly towards that beacon. And, and the, the South Africans used them to great effect in, um, in Southwest. Uh, all the vast tracks there, they, they used to fly them in on, C on C-130s and use super free ones to put them in position. So they, um, they, they lasted fairly well. Now, it was fairly old technology. And, and the recording was actually stainless steel wire on an aluminium drum that rotated off the same um, gearbox that rotated the actual antenna. So it was all geared together and you had a, a magnetic head. We had a series of magnetic heads that would follow this drum as it rotated. It was about um, just on half a meter in diameter and a meter long. It was basically like an old Edison uh, uh, wax um, type that went along as it went around it, but um, seeing as we dragged them through the bush on, behind a trailer down the Land Rover, they, they didn't last very well. And uh, you'd have the call that such and such a beacon has gone off and you'd go out to the place and uh, you, you, you go inside and all you surround it is this vast um, spider web of, of stainless steel wire that had broken and just uncoiled inside the cab. So there was just this web of stainless steel. So you had to drag all that out, put a new voice drum on, recalibrate it and it went. And um, it was very good for the South African policemen and the SAP helicopters that were working in the Zambezi Valley. They had about three of them on the edge of the escarpment there and it helped these guys because uh, most of them hadn't done map reading as the Rhodesians had. And it helped them find out where they were going, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the, one of the things about the, um, the TAC-14 was the fact that it had this uh, thousand watts of power. And wherever you went, um, it would just swamp the local um, radios as in brown job radios, civvy radios, and the, um, and the teleprinters that they used was uh, a French unit called a cocolet. And uh, it actually worked on 12 audio tones rather than just the two tones uh, of the FSK for the, uh, the standard radio teleprinters. And it was a very, very good system. It, 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 it would get through when, when, when nothing else got through because you, you had the combination of 12 tones to give you the code. And um, the SAP operators that first headed up with us, um, but, um, it's because the war was escalating and more and more information had to be sent in from the field, as in the SITREPS and um, all the information, they all had to be encoded at the end of the, uh, the jock meeting. And, and, and the South Africans actually brought up Enigma machines, which were the same as they used in the Second World War, the Germans did, except that these were super duper u to the latest thing for the 60s. And they encoded everything and um, onto a tape, basically the, the, the five finger punch tape. And it would uh, um, encode everything into five letter groups. And you then have to send these through on either lower or upper sideband. And um, everybody knew that when you were sending because th this power just killed everything. And the guys that be trying to listen to, uh, uh, to Sally Donaldson and, and um, they couldn't hear anything except these 12 audio tones all the way through, you know. No, nobody liked us, but they worked very well. And um, um, those were deployed to all the FAFs and, and the jocks. And um, I spent an awful lot of time at FAF 2 as, as a junior because it was great stuff because you, your board was free and um, everything was free and you didn't have to do guard duties because everyone at Serum had to do guard duties. Um, all the juniors basically and it was basically one night a week and one weekend a month you you had to go out and go out and make sure that nobody stole anything you know? but um the, in, in in the early days they had um field telephones where um and they had a tower at the bomb dump they had a tower at transmitters which was just the, the steel gantry that you had to climb up and um the uh, the actual security area was guarded by the gsu and the all well, the hound mechanics you know with, with, with their dogs and um, the, uh, um, they had a patrol around the aircraft and, uh, and then we had to guard the outskirts and they gave us Lienfield 303s and um, they're real modern stuff. But um, it was uh, the, uh, the ammunition. They didn't trust us little buggers. So they used to give you five rounds of 303 ammunition and it would be put in a canvas pouch that was sewn together and it had two tabs on the top. 
that if, if anything happened, you sort of basically, hold on a sec, I have to open my, and you have to tear this bag open and load your whole field and say, halt or I'll tie my dog loose or halt or I'll shoot my dog was up again. Um, <laughs> the way they'd go, you know, but um, oh, it, was, it was a lot a minute, really. And um, what I used to do, I used to volunteer to do the, the, the 5.30 to 1.30 shift in one hit. And um, it's one of the interesting things. I always used to volunteer for the bomb dump because that's when old Jack Mullock used to wind up his DC-7s in the, in the Super Connie at midnight. And they'd be at the end of the runway, you're at the end of the runway, and you'd, you'd listen to these things winding up and rolling down the hill and um, always waiting to hear if they made it up the other side, you know, and these old DC-7s clawing to there with their frozen beef and frozen chicken. Uh, and it was all very interesting. But um, as I say, in the, in the Ford airfields, they, they had the uh, national servicemen doing the guard duty, so you didn't have to do anything like that. But... Um, with the radios, basically, once everything was tuned and working, you had nothing to do. So I used to um, hang around the, the guys with the helicopters and um, the, the fixed wing. And I learned a lot about aircraft then, you know, because, um, as I say, there's nothing more boring than a faff when nothing's going on. And uh, I always remember um, Rob Loomis was posted to Force Squadron, and um, he was um, at uh, FAF 2 with his Trojan, brand new Trojan. It was the end thing, you know. And, and, and nobody um, pulled the piss out of them then. But um, one of the, everybody I've heard say that, that they, they were converters, they converted fuel straight to noise and they could take a, um, a, a bird strike on the trailing edge, you know. And, and, and um, in the early days, we actually used them for noise cover. When we were going in on a seven squadron strike, you'd send the old troggy in to make as much noise as possible, which wasn't hard. But uh, one of the things that they don't mention is the fact that they took the airspeed indicator out and replaced it with a calendar. Yeah, so I was there on uh, that uh, FAF2 with Robin on one on Saturday afternoon. Um, we, he got a call to prepare the aircraft for Kazakh because um, some fellow had gone into a water ski ramp as opposed to going over it, and he wasn't in very good shape. So they, he had to be, be Kazakh out to uh, Salisbury. So they brought this fellow out in the ambulance and um, threw him in the back of the Trojan on, on, on the stretcher, and Rob was sitting in the right-hand seat, and his pilot was in the left-hand seat. And they went to to start and it was met with silence uh, the with a solenoid had packed up so um that was the end of it they didn't have a spare solenoid so i, I, I tapped on the windscreen and i said to rob give me your screwdriver you know, the trojan's got a thing called a punker louver which is a little round hole in the perspex that had a plug in it basically that you could turn and get fresh air in so he passed me the the screwdriver through the window i undid the cowling and the on the right hand side of the aircraft where the solenoid was i jammed the, uh, the screwdriver across the contacts and started up the, the old Trojan and did the counting back up and away they went. Okay. As you say, um, the older it is, you have to make a plan, my plan. So away you went and um, as I say, I used to help Robert his aircraft quite a lot. And then um, as I was with the, the FAFs, if there was a new jock opened up, they'd send attack 14 out there and you'd go out and you'd be there for a month or two and then you'd be replaced by somebody else. And um, yeah, it was all, as I say, you were always at the shop and, and, and you got to know everybody. You got to know the four squadron guys, the seven squadron guys, um, all the, um, the people in the field, the brown jobs, with my brother being in the SAS. Um, I, I knew the SAS, well, that they had a soft spot for me because I was brother of one of theirs. And um, one of the first um, externals I went on was on a sky shot. Now, um, I listened to your uh, interview with the uh, um, the, the one, one fellow, good old um, Tiernis, uh, you said to this morning to him. And he, he, yeah, uh, he, he mentions the, the sky shot. What it was, uh, a Dakota with two huge speakers. They, they, they took the whole parador out. They had these two speakers in the back there, and they'd have a 24 um, volt transistorized amplifier. And um, you went out as, as the radio guy, because um, you were given a, a TR28 HF set. And um, a, a big box of AA batteries and a cassette recorder. And uh, the two pilots, um, uh, the tech was Willie Armitage. He got this thing sorted out. We had VIP seats in the back of the deck and we flew to Tet. And we were based there for 10 days. And the idea was um, we would go over the future Kapora Bassa Dam area, warning the people that it was going to flood. And we were there for 10 days, basically flying in advancing orbit. And I'd changing the batteries, reversing the tape, et cetera, et cetera, and throwing out leaflets. 
and uh, we, we were billeted in the officer's mess at Tet, which was all very good, you know, being being the old flying crew, of course you have to go with the officer's mess, you know, and the mere, mere um, troopy, you know, it was, it was fairly good. And then um, after about the third day we were there, uh, an old Atlas rolled up um, where the larger aircraft were parked was right in the end, end of the, the security area. They had um, lights pointing out, but it's exactly the same as our airfields. And they had guards and what have you. So this Nord Atlas pulled in there because it had engine trouble. And it was parked next to where we parked the deck. And they said, it's not a problem. We, we're going to send a, um, another Nord Atlas to bring you a spare engine. So we didn't, it didn't affect us. We got off early in the morning. I got in the um, SSB, the GR-28 call serum, gave them the area we're going to operate it in. And we went away for six hours and did our sky shot, came back. And on this next day, there's two Nord Atlases there and they offloaded this engine, but during the offloading, they dropped this new engine. So, um, North Face Mild, you know, we would get another one. But um, part of the operating uh, procedure was um, first flight, I'd go up with um, Willie and we'd um, turn the DAC engines because you had to turn nine blades for each engine to get the oil out of the bottom cylinders and you know, help him take the locks out and refuel and get ready to go. And um, the... Um, Portuguese um, troops, they had a bellier with a machine gun on the back and they used to open the gates. And LOA-3, Portuguese Air Force LOA-3 used to take them at the same time and do a recce around the runway and fly up and down, make sure that there weren't any Freddies around uh, to, to, to spoil our day. So on, on this day, there's there's two Nord Atlases, there's one DC-3, and, 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 and the security areas are getting very crowded. And the bellier went to open the gates and this LOA-3 went up and as it lifted off, not realizing or not working out the close confines. Its main rotors hit the wingtip of the serviceable Nord Atlas. And uh, as you can imagine, there was a big pile of rubbish everywhere and uh, and we couldn't fly that day. But they managed to sort it all out and um, they uh, took one of the serviceable engines out of the now US Nord Atlas and put in the other Nord Atlas. Uh, and that one they, they shoved towards the end of the runway and I well, went through Tet many years later, it was still on the end of the runway. Uh, a lot of good stuff. You know. And um, after that, we, uh, we came back. And some of the other externals I went on, um, when 7 Squadron and the SAS went to Chicago, um, I went along as the radio guy because we had um, SMD 422B radios and VHF radios, a little Honda generator and a battery. And it was my job to make sure that this battery never went flat and to make sure that the operator, um, he could send his signals at the end of the day. Um, Ozzy Benton was in charge of our lot at that particular time. And all the stories you hear about that poor old troopy that got shot by the Cape guy and he was a shit cook. But um, the actual story behind it was the fact that uh, we had four Alouettes from the Rhodesian Air Force and we had four Alouettes from the Portuguese Air Force. Um, they flew with doors on and they had the Cape car there, which they flew with doors on. And um, these uh, Portuguese went sort of interested in our, our tactics of, of dropping the SAS off and uh, some of the, uh, the, the Parakadish, which is the, the paras, the Portuguese paras. And um, they'd go and land, drop these guys off, and away they'd go, and, and, and their K-car would go out, might put around in the bush or two, and then head back. And obviously, Benton this was, said this was a hell of a waste of resources. So they actually um, took um, the K-car fit out of, of, of the, the aircraft, and they put it on 44-gallon drums on the side of the runway. And uh, we were basically um, in, a, in a school building, um, which faced the football field where we parked. And, um, and the Portuguese had, had, had their tents up on the left-hand side of us. And that's where the accident happened. The, the armaments officer was um, showing his mates how this thing worked. And it went bang, and that was pointed towards the tents that exploded outside the tent. And that's where this poor trippy was. The SAS medics tried to save him, but uh, he was long gone. But um, uh, as I say, that's the uh, uh, the actual full story of what happened there. And um, there one afternoon, and um, one of the Portuguese aircrafts had been for servicing uh, to Tet, and he came back and he gave a hell of a, a beat up of the camp, showing off. And he flew over us, and uh, he did a, um, a helicopter spraying torque turn on the other end, and was heading back into land, and he misjudged the whole lot, and he came thundering into the ground and not realizing he was downwind. And he just put this thing into the deck and shared the undercarriage off. And, and there was an awful lot of noise while it beat itself to death. And then we all ran and he said, yeah, it's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. There's no worry, no fight one. <laughs> so, uh, 
um, that was a, another write-off. You know, it was uh, all very interesting. Interesting, uh, should I say? And then um, this is one of the other interesting um, things that happened. I was actually, and uh, I'd been promoted from internal security radio to um, a branch called Radnad, which is radio design and development with uh, Paul Phipps and uh, Bob Furzer. And uh, we had just got the um, AR400 Becker radios. They, they managed to get a few hundred of these things in from Germany. They were transistorized. And um, all the aircrafts, um, except for, for the Trojans, which had transistorized stuff new, they used the, um, the TR 1987, which is a Second World War um, VHF radio a valve job, a box about uh, three times the size, of three shoeboxes put together. And it only had 10 channels. And if you wanted to, if, if the hunter, say, had to fly th from Thornhill through Salisbury down to South Africa, um, they'd have to change all the, uh, all the crystals in to make sure he had enough um, frequencies to get him to where he was going. So, um, and, and the hunters liked it because you only had 10 channels and you had a selector that you could um, select channel one and you looked at the uh, channel guide and it gave you the frequencies. So you didn't have to uh, know where you were. You could actually feel which channel you were on. And, uh, and when we put the AR400s in the hunter, uh, the old hunter jocks were not very happy about this because there were these tiny little knobs and they actually had to have a look at the dial when they were selecting in frequencies. So we had it modified and we put very big uh, knobs in for them so they could use their, uh, their, their delicate little fingers on these great big knobs. So it, it helped a bit, but, the, but they were never very happy about it. And the um, other thing that they brought, um, that we bought with the AR400s was the, um, the Becker Hummer, the ZVG2. Um, uh, you've heard um, uh, Nigel uh, Henson, who had the app, and he mentioned the Roadrunner and how they looked for the signal. Now, um, it, it wasn't actually looking for signal strength. You were looking for signal direction. What the, uh, the Becker Hummer was, was two um, uh, quarter wave antennas on, on the roof of the aircraft, basically. They were 400 millimeters apart, roughly quarter wave length. And um, the, um, the gizmo is in the, uh, the Homer. Everything was set at quarter wavelengths. So um, if you received a, a signal from a, a station, if one aerial was pointing or leading towards that, that station, the needle would indicate that there was more signal coming from the one antenna than the other one. So what you used to do was um, you'd, you'd then turn towards where the, um, the, the needle said the signal was until it, it zeroed out, basically. So um, you were then flying directly towards the signal. but. Um, with the with the Roadrunner that was uh, um, done by the, the special branch uh, and, and Trevor Ward and Roger Kappa, and they were in the Prime Minister Prime Minister's Department radio section in Coglin House in Salisbury. I don't know if you remember the the Coglin House, a big, I think it's about eight stories of red brick in the middle of nowhere, and they were on the top floor of that. And I was working for Agricare at the time at Mount Hamden, and um, so Trevor used to call me up and give me. A frequency because I had a fairly extensive radio shop at Mount Hamden and I used to give him a, a signal strength of that particular beacon and then um, when he explained exactly what they, they were using it for um, one of the problems with the ZVG2 was the fact that it was meant to be used with the AR400 which started at 116 megs and it went up to 130 megs which is a hell of a spread so it was um, one size fits all and it wasn't 100% um, sensitive around the, the frequencies that we were looking for. So I went out the the radio section. I, I managed to get a few um, old homers that had been in crashed aircraft. And um, I, I went to the University of Rhodesia where, where Professor Max van Olst ran his radio shop. Uh, Trevor and myself in 1972 had been sent there to do a three-month uh, uh, radio um, antenna course with Professor Max van Olst. And he had all the gear there, so I, I tuned this thing up for the frequencies that we were using, and it really increased the uh, the sensitivity, and it worked out well from there. But um, while we're strongly on the homers, um, one of the problems with the Alouette three and the the, the the two antennas, they have to be on a metal surface, which is known as a ground plane. So that was in on the top of the aircraft wing, or underneath the aircraft. Um, you put the two of them in there, and and the ground plane would act as a reflecting plane. But uh, the problem with the Alouettes was um, if, if, if you put the an antennas on the roof, 
the um, the, the rotor blanked out everything when you were going forward. And if you put them on, on the bottom, the uh, the rear was uh, facing downwards and backwards, so you couldn't get a clear line of sight. So that's when we, we developed the two um, half-wave dipole and antennas that you see on the front of the revision helicopters. And um, the easy way to tell the difference between a Rhodesian helicopter and a South African helicopter was the fact that um, the homers in the South African aircraft were based around the 40 megs and not the um, aircraft band. So they were much larger. And if, if you have, have a look at the photos of the aircraft, you can actually see the South African ones because the, the, the homer and antennas are almost as wide as the aircraft. And the bottom half of the dipoles always taken off because they got, always got wiped out in the bush. And that was one of the problems of having um, the um, South African aircraft is, is the fact that you, you couldn't do the humming duties if you were looking for a, a, a trippy on the ground or something like that. Um, so they didn't have the, the um, hum, humming capability. And then um, this is one of the interesting ones from the early days when we were first working with the, SA, the SAP. Um, one of these SAP guys got lost in the Zambezi Valley and the, the uh, helicopter pilot flying was towards him and said, uh, just give me a homing signal, which meant all you did was just hold the transmit button. You didn't have to modulate it at all. And he didn't know what the hell was going on. So he gave it his best shot and he keyed the transmitter and he said, Chopper come home, Chopper come home, Chopper come home. <laughs> uh, all very interesting, you know. And then um, I, I got called out to Op Lobster with, with Attack 14. And um, that was at, uh, at, uh, at, at Rishingat. And um, I was phoned up by the signals officer. He said, I don't care what, just get in that tack and go to Rishinga. And um, so I hopped in it, got my ice kit, and drove off with the tack 14. It's a diesel generator on the back and went to Mount Darwin, got there, someone got the hour in the morning. And um, they were very surprised to see me there, this one Land Rover just rolling up on its own because uh, uh, that's basically when the big ops started there. And um, I said, I've been told to report to Rishinga. So um, I went there and um, the first thing I did when I drove in was the CEO came down and he said, what the hell are you doing here? Who you gave you permission to, to, to come here? And I gave him the, uh, my, my authorization from um, signals at New Serum. And once he sorted that out, he said, no, you can take this thing and get off my site. He said, I don't want you anywhere in my security area. So I had to park outside the gate to set this thing up because he didn't want his comms messed up. And um, that's basically the last time I, I think they sort of used Attack 14 because um, I'd been to um, a record in South Africa um, where they made all the radio, the SSP radios. And um, we um, were introduced to the 422B, which we'd had for many years, and also the, the TR-28. Uh, I think you're familiar with it, with the TR-28, the HF SSB set. Yeah, uh, wasn't it a TR forty eight that we had? Oh uh, well, it was the uh, twenty eight or forty eight. It was the same thing. Uh, the, the twenty eight was uh, was synthesized, which means you could basically dial any frequency. Was was the the forty eight um, had fixed uh, channels? Okay. Um, yeah. So you guys couldn't listen to LM radio, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just re I just remember they were, they had bloody huge batteries that we had to carry in the yeah. Sputnik aerial and everything. And yeah, so when, whenever we went on an external op, we always had those you know, 48s and we had to carry these bloody heavy batteries. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I went down there and it's one of the things that they were um, working on was a civilian version of the TR 2848 uh, or the TR 38, which was um, a, uh, a four channel um, uh, civvy version, which was a, a shoebox size. And um, plugged in the battery, it was meant for civvies. But they also made an airborne version of this SSB radio, but it was the a synthesized version uh, um, that could be installed in a DAC because um, the DACs didn't have HF, well, they had HF comms, but it was HF AM and only on, um, on, on civil frequencies. So they um, had this uh, um, airborne version, I think it's called the AL38. Uh, and um, I was shown how to work it, and I was sent back to New Serum, and I was uh, attached to three squadron for a month. Everywhere this DAC went, I went with it, and I did radio tests and various other things. It worked out fairly well, but uh, it wasn't built uh, rugged for our conditions. So it was returned, um, and a, a much stronger version was finally sent up. And um, 
at the end of all that, that basically I'd, I'd been there, done that, done all the radio stuff. And um, I applied to join the uh, join Seven Squadron because um, uh, as I say, I'd done six or so, five, five ideas in radio section. And uh, I'd, I, to my word, first year I was there, I applied to be uh, drivers, airframe pilots for the use of. And um, I was told in no uncertain terms that they could um, train a pilot in 18 months, whereas a technician took forever. So go away. You know? So I, I, I never got to be a pilot, basically. So I joined Seven Squadron. I joined with, um, uh, in 1973, early 73, with um, Ginger Morris, Gary Whittle, um, uh, my captain, and Norman Farrell and myself. There were the five of us. And in amongst that whole lot, you got uh, one BCR, one. Um, uh, SCR, two DMMs, and about five MFCs out of those five. So, it was a, and our instructor was um, a guy called Ted Holland. He'd been on this for a long time, officially known to us as Dutchy. And um, he did, taught us everything that there was to know about the Alloy 3 and how to look after it. Because um, in those early days, um, one or two helicopters were attached to an army unit. There was no fire force per se. And, um, and you were basically taught how to fire the MAG and um, how to look off the MAG, how to look off the aircraft, service it, and how to hoist, and various other, all, all the uh, duties that you had to do. And um, we were taught hoisting at, um, out at Seki and um, got dunked in the water there. One of the interesting things about being um, put down in the water, you, you knew you were going to get put down in the water. And um, one of the techs we had was an Irishman called Finbar Cunningham. He was on training course. And um, he was an Irishman, do as you could get it. And um, he was actually uh, teaching Henry Javi. You've heard of the, the Javi Tubbs duo, the, the naughtiest buggers in the Air Force. And um, he was hoisting Henry. And they went down into the dam and did dunk him a few times and sorted him out. And when Henry got hoisted back into the aircraft and Finn was um, bringing him in, basically, old Henry had this smile. You know, if he didn't have ears, the top of his head would have fallen off. He was smiling so much. And um, you know, Finn tried to work out what was what was going on and I'll tell Henry and except he's flying overalls and underneath it he had all Finbar's number two uniform on. Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he sorted that out and that's just one of the inter interesting things of uh, being on seven and, and working with those buggers. They, 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 they truly were naughty buggers. But uh, always a pleasure to have them around. They always brought your morale up, you know. And um, uh, we went to uh, a Katanga range and um, we were let loose on the MAG. We were given 200 rounds to um, fire at will, and then you had to fire into an 8x8 eight eight, um, plywood um, target on the ground. 8x8 eight eight white had uh, been whitewashed and was laid flat on the ground, and, and, and the pilot had to orbit round at sort of 74 knots, sort of seven, anything between 750 and 800 feet. And how the pilot used to orient himself with um, to the actual target as uh, for the MAG, the Brownings, and the uh, and the KCAR, was he had to look across the left hand side of the aircraft to where the uh, main door frame was on the on the left hand side of the aircraft, and where the door frame actually met the floor on the forward part. That's where he he framed the target. So he flew his orbit, and as long as the target was in that area, uh, in the in the KCAR command, it was right at the commander's feet. Where he, where he had to side it up because you know, the, the KCAR commander faced backwards. And um, the uh, MAG had a, a chest plate and uh, two handles and two triggers. And you basically had to kneel on the floor. They actually issued you uh, knee pads that, that fitted inside your overalls because the floor of the alouette was, um, that had um, anti slip on it. And, uh, and you used to hang onto this gun and, and you'd be on your knees and and uh, aiming at the target and, and, and you let rip them. I found this very uncomfortable because uh, uh, being five foot 14 or six foot two in the old language, um, it, it was, um, it's, it's, it's very hard to sort it out. So um, in the, um, uh, when the MAGs were issued from the Armory, um, they were actually um, issued in a plywood box, which was the size of the, um, of, of the gun without the barrel on and um, the, uh, with the grips on the back. And it had a reflector sight, which was uh, harmonized for your orbit and your speed. And um, in, in, in the box, um, in case it had to be used for defense, the original wooden butt was still in there. 
So uh, after firing the, the first couple of rounds, I decided that this wasn't very good. So I actually took the, uh, the twin handles off and I put the butt back on and you could actually then sit in the gunner seat and um, brace yourself against the, the front door and everything. And, and you could hold that gun very steady. So the, uh, um, the average rate of fire to be a, a marksman on the, um, on the MAG was to get 18% strikes out of 200 rounds which was uh, 36 odd rounds in, um, in, in, in this eight by eight. And uh, I went up and I tried this lot and um, we went down to, um, uh, to count and paste uh, the targets and was on the range. You had a little book of uh, white patches and, um, and, and the government issued glue, you know, that you had to glue them back onto. And um, went down with, with Dutchie Holland and there were 132 strikes in this target. Wow. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, um, this thing hasn't been patched from the last two rounds. He said, you're going to have to shoot going. So I said, fine. I said, we patched it up and went up, had another 200 rounds. And, uh, and this time there were 167 rounds in the, in the target. And then, um, so. It's funny. I had, I had the exact same experience um, when I was doing my conventional warfare phase in the RLI. I think uh, somewhere near Nkomo barracks. And um, when I was a youngster, my dad taught me how to fire, how to shoot a rifle accurately at night. Yeah. Because we used to do a lot of hunting off the back of a bucky at night, you know, for the pot. And uh, my dad always, you know, showed me that when you're shooting at night, you always fire high, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and we we went to the range and they kind of illuminated it with with uh, paraluminating flares and whatever and uh, it was a night shoot and most of the guys were had about five percent strikes on a on a on a FN with a magazine of twenty rounds you know you got you got five hits um, and I, I had all twenty hits in the in my target. And I was disqualified because they said uh, the same thing to me. They said, oh, from pre your target wasn't patched previously and whatever. So, you know, we got. <laughs> and yeah, uh, um, but anyway, that's that's super impressive and and yeah, quite interesting to me. Well, as an, well, was, as an yeah, MAG well, gun. <laughs> but it, was, it was a lovely gun to shoot, you know. And um, if, if you really braced it, uh, it was very accurate. Yeah. And, um, I, I was given the, uh, the gunner's trophy. Um, by Eddie Wilkie, um, and, and I held it right through to 1983 when I left for Australia, and I gave it back to the squadron. Sure. But um, so I did exactly the same with the things with the Brownings, um, the, the K car. Um, I, I don't know if you, well, you've obviously seen many photographs and you've seen the K car itself. Um, I actually used to sit on the floor, and I was cross legged uh, behind the gun. The most important reason was put an awful lot of metal between you and the open door you know because you could hide behind that gun but but also it gave you the exact right um shooting attitude and you could really brace that gun on your knees and uh, you you made it very very accurate and sure. um it's, it's been mentioned how accurate it was i was flying with dave thorne and um and uh, uh Chipinga, and um they'd flown us out a new, new k car because the other one had too many holes in it so it had to be sent back and um we uh went to the um the rifle range in, in Chipinga and um I, I had an empty shoebox uh, with a brick in it that we just placed on the butts and we went up and went round and I fired one round and was right next to it and then the second round actually went through the shoebox so it was ominous so it was good but um the the, the, the mayhem it caused in Chipinga because no one had actually heard this this thing going off in the town before and they were evacuating hospitals and schools and all sorts of things. It was an awful lot of nonsense. You know? Yeah. Um, I know that rifle range well because I grew up in Chipinga. So yeah, yeah I practiced as a kid on that rifle range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was all very interesting. And then um, uh, this is one of the things that I, I, I forgot to mention when I was in the radio section it was um, with this uh, liaison with Rackall and what have you. I went down and um, we were introduced to the, um, the TR-15 which uh, was, was, was the base radio, the um, HF base radio, 100 watts. And um, to try and get away from uh, the TAC-14 type issue, um, the record uh, produced a power supply and an FSK converter. Now, the power supply meant you, you didn't have to run on batteries, you could run it anywhere. 
and um, the, they uh, sold it as, as, as a package with the latest Siemens um, printer, which uh, was very quiet compared to the Coca-Cola and the original stuff that we had in the content. So they brought those back and, and it, it was decided rather than having a, a dedicated vehicle that was basically a waste of transport for the, for, for the radios, um, they would put them in caravans. So you could tow it to the site and the commander still had his wheels. And um, the, the first couple of caravans they organized through the, through the radio section uh, was through a friend of a cousin's brother's fifth aunt and various other things. And, and, uh, and these things rolled up at, at New Serum. Well, we had to go and pick them up from where they were made. And um, you knew something was wrong when you, when you went to unhitch them and you wound down the, uh, the four legs and they didn't even touch the ground. They were, they were six inches too short. And um, uh, Bill Mumford went on the first trials. They went down to uh, um, Chirundu and then they went on the Mona Pools Road and came back over the Skiskop and by Sapelilo there. And these things were made out of boxwood and uh, gerata, basically, or galvanized iron, and they fell to pieces. So um, after that, they actually went out and bought some real ones from um, uh, 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 gypsy caravans. I think they made them. And uh, after that, they, they had these... Um, that is the radio communications because they um, the, the um, in, encryption had actually changed from the um, Enigma units um, with the advance of, of semiconductors and transistors, the right stuff. Um, rather than having to encode a, a message individually, um, they would make up two master tapes, which were the uh, the printer tapes. As long as the two were identical and they were marked where they started and finished, if you mixed that with your original a signal tape, it gave you um, a code at the end, which which was rubbish. Um, you couldn't understand it. And you could only decode it by uh, remixing it with the original master. So um, you had these um, uh, the twin tape machines. And um, it, it saved a hell of a lot of time, but it, it didn't really because um, the um, in, in, in those days, um, everybody sent all their communication by radio. So the HF spectrum was full, you know, you had your commercial radio stations, all the uh, Reuters and various other things, you, you had stations plus uh, the British and uh, and the allies were jamming us, so they would see where our frequency would, would pop up and, and that'd get jammed. So, uh, or to aid the cause, if you know what I mean. Right. But, all, but also the, um, uh, the FSK system, only having uh, the two tones wasn't very good because a lightning strike would set it off and, um, with the old um, in, in Enigma um, five letter groups, you could actually go back to where you lost it and resend from that point because the um, the operators they could actually read the tapes. They knew what it was. They didn't have to um, measure it and work it out. So they'd, they'd put it back in and then you'd send again. But it, it still took a hell of a time. And, and with the um, new system, every tape had to be resent if if there was even the uh, the smallest amount of, of corruption. So um, I, 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 uh, I got into trouble for this. I actually got some of the old, um, old Coca-Cola sets and um, I hooked them up to this brand new um, TR-15 and I got John Hack and Phil Russell. They were going to FAF-1 to, to decommission attack 14 and in, install a new um, Siemens up there. And um, I hooked them up with a loom to run the Coca-Cola through the SSB, through the TR-15. And it worked exceptionally well because they, they'd send the FSK signal in the Coca-Cola and it all worked very well. And um, when I gave all this evidence to the signals officer, his first impression was misuse of government equipment and he wanted to have me charged. Now, he was not impressed. But um, after they had a look exactly how it worked, um, everything was immediately put back to Coca-Cola, but going through the, the TR-15s. And um, it worked exceptionally. And, and then that's how it worked right to the end. And then the, uh, the Coca-Cola printers were actually replaced with um, a cochlear, cochlear emulator, which was um, just a unit that only sent the tones. It didn't, you didn't have to have a big noisy teleprinter on top of it. And uh, so it was about, about then that I left the radio section and went to seven. And then um, uh, when I was, uh, went to seven, we were, one of the early times was, um, we were based at Musangedzi and we had to fly to Macombi every day because it wasn't safe to leave the aircraft there. We were working with the SAS and the RAI at Macombi. And um, where we were based with, there was an Aldimenta, which was the Portuguese protected village. And um, we'd go and wait around the ops from all day. And um, 
uh, our signals guys were there. And uh, there was one Portuguese operator there, and they had a, a TR-48. And it, it was switched off, so I sort of asked him through an interpret why it was switched off, and he said it didn't work. You know? So being a radio, I had a look at it, and it worked out where the problem was with the antenna, fixed the antenna, sorted him out with some new batteries, and uh, got this thing fired up. And he, he called TET, which was their base. And um, he was very surprised when he said it were comms five by fives. And uh, he said five by five, so he was very happy. But, but then the operator in, in TET shot him down in flames and he said, listen, don't call us unless you're being attacked. You know, so, <laughs> so this poor bugger was a little bit browbeaten. You know. you know, he says, you really have to feel for those Portuguese guys, I tell you. Uh, and they, they had it rough. You know. Yeah. But um, it, it, it was all very interesting. Um, one of the things with the, uh, the sky shot about um, Warabasa filling up, um, this was we were based in, in, in Macombe area, and the SAS and the RAR had been working north of the Zam in, in, in the Warabasa area, and they noticed that there were an awful lot of people um, moving out, all, all the locals. They, they, were, they could see the water was rising, and they basically came up against this big full stop, which is the Zambezi River. And um, Nigel from, not Nigel, uh, uh, Barrett, I think, from the SAS, he, he got together with the RAR and the Internal Affairs, and they worked out that, that they would evacuate these refugees across the river. And um, it was all worked out. It was, a, it was a really horrible day. It was raining. So um, Ian Harvey was the one pilot with Phil Tubbs. I forget who was there with. And what we basically did was we pulled our aircraft right down to nothing. We took a gun off. We took the air filter elements out um, because there was no dust. It was raining. They also robbed you of power. And we took all the seats out. And um, you basically went across the river where the SAS had organized these, these guys, the refugees, into, into sticks or groups. And they'd sort of work on five troops because in those days we actually used to, to take five trippies. And they sort of roughly estimate the weight and they would line them up and you'd land and you'd load them up with all their goods and shuttles and put them in and make sure that they would tighten all their stuff in the side panel. And then you'd lift off just for a trip across the Zam and you'd do a head count and you'd tell the pilot so many and he would just write it in China Graph and Perspex. You didn't have time to write it in the book. And uh, you went all day just ferrying these guys across. And I remember Ian Harvey, they, they had 18 on board. And uh, Phil Tubbs, he, he said, 18. He said, uh, yeah, Phil said, I, I'll recount. And he said, 18. And then this lid came off a pot and there was a baby inside it. So he said, no, 19. <laughs> you know, so they spread the slot across. And um, one of the interesting stories from that was, I don't know if you've ever heard of Reggie the donkey. Um, one of the, the headmen or chiefs in this area, his son had uh, back to polio. So his legs were mangled. And... Um, his only form of transport, we had a little cart that he used to hook up behind this tame donkey, Reggie, and it used to take him everywhere. And Reggie had brought him up to the site there, basically, and um, they were going to let him go, you know. So the SS guy says, no, we can't do this. So they got together with Ian Harvey and they said, you know, what can we do for this bloke, you know? So um, old Harvey said, oh, we'll make a plan here. So he got the cargo net and a chain and they laid the cargo net out on the ground and they walked Reggie right into the middle of it and they picked up the four corners, hooked it into the chain and then hooked that on the cargo swing and they lifted up Reggie and there's this donkey hanging out the bottom of a cargo swing and they landed him on the Rhodesian side and they brought his cot over as well and uh, the RAR, they had them in their RLs and, and they were taking them to a settlement area somewhere in Zimbabwe or Rhodesia and um, as soon as they arrived in this area, uh, the local DC um, he didn't like Reggie and, and decided that he was vermin because he had no certs and he had no vaccinations. So he put a head, a bullet through his head, which annoyed the, the RLI immensely. And um, and this guy was very lucky to get away with his life because the RAI wanted to peel him to pieces. You know, but they actually found another baby donkey, which, which they gave to this guy. You know, it's it's, it's one of the the feel good sides of it. But um, there are photographs around of old Reggie being transported across the Zambezi River on the edge of the swing there with old halves and tubs. You know. Uh, for, I operated in Mozambique with Dave Thorne for about three months, I think, um, from Mugby, um, Nova Mugby, um, to, uh, all the way down, and um, talking about the poor old trippies. Um, it's one of the things with the um, LO3 is uh, your fuel goes through a filter, 
you'll see in the notes I gave you there, the filter is made up of five sections of phosphor bronze. And it, it, it basically flows through one through the other. And, and if it gets blocked, there's a the relief plunger that the, the booster pump will force uh, this plunger open. And it will bring up a light on the dash that says you have got a blocked fuel filter. And you've got five minutes to land and change the filter. Otherwise, you have to change the engine because the, um, the contaminants would um, go through in, in the combustion chamber and they would uh, uh, make hot spots on the turbine blades and they would actually burn through the turbine blades at these hot spots. So as soon as you've got a fuel for the warning light, you have to land and change. So we were flying uh, from uh, Macombi to Tech to take somebody there. And on the south bank of the Zam, the fuel filter warning light came up and they said, we've got to find somebody to land, but this is Indian territory. And um, saw the white building on, on, on the side of the Zam, the Portuguese flag. So we said, we'll take our luck and land down there. So we landed and Dave Thorne got out and spoke to these guys. There were two Marines, Portuguese Marines, and their sole purpose in life, they had a rowing boat that they had to row people across the Zambezi River to the other side. If anybody wanted to transport in these two Marines, their job was to row them either one way or the other. And these guys have basically been abandoned there and, and they had nothing. You know, they, that they'd gone local basically to get food and various other things. And then they had about one round between them for their G3s and their uniforms were in tatters, you know, the, the normal thing. So I gave them one of my um, belts out of the MAG, which sorted them out for a bit. And then when we landed in, um, in Tet, Dave went and saw the officer morning there and organized ammunition and new clothing and rations and a couple of damage on the wine. So we were quite the heroes and we went back and gave these guys the stuff, but, but nobody worried about them, you know, that they were just there and, you know, so what, you know, it, it was very sad. And uh, I was with um, one of the uh, digressing and going back just a, a little bit, um, having worked in, in the radio sections, which was right in the middle of New Serum, um, you had uh, uh, three squadron on your left, parachute training um, hangar, well, the half the hangar was um, on the left. I, I think you know the, the hangar I'm talking about, the uh, parachute training section hangar yeah. at New Serum. And uh, IS radio was on the other side of that, and uh, um, five squadron was on the right hand side, and seven squadron further on from that. And um, th 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 um, those are the days when they had the bomb box, they used to have um, had 96. Um, 20 pound frag bombs that they used to put in a bomb box and the bomb box had six bays in it. And there were three, three box bays per bay. And um, the two outer boxes held five bombs in and the, and the middle one held six. So it gave you 96. And these bombs were um, armed in the bomb dump and they were inserted in the boxes at the bomb dump. And then they were taken by uh, tractor and, uh, and, and bomb trolley they take them from the bomb dump down the buried track. They take them around the outside of New Serum and down to Five Squadron. Um, because as each bomb is placed in the box, it had a, a nose and a, and a tail fuse. And there was a wire through each fuse with a clip that held it in place and a loop on the end of the wire, which they attached to the top of the box. So as each box went in, it, as, as each bomb went in, its uh, nose and fuse wires were attached to the box. So when the bottom of the box opened up, the bomb fell out and um, uh, they were armed as soon as they dropped clear of the box, basically. And um, they had air movements at three squadron. There was a lot of air movements. So this guy driving these three bomb trolleys behind his tractor decided he's going to take a shortcut through the middle of New Serum. So he sort of turned right in, in front of the Canada Air Hangar, past the PTS Hangar, turned left in front of the radio section. But um, the, those, uh, the trolleys don't follow exactly 100% true. And, and the, the last trailer, its le left rear wheel went into the stormwater drain and this one, two boxes fell over and the bombs fell out and armed themselves into the stormwater drain. And all of these damn things went off in the stormwater drain. But fortunately, by this time, the, the, um, uh, the motion of the trailers had pulled everything else clear. And then these bombs started going off in, in, inside the stormwater drain. Fortunately, it was in the drain. It was contained in the drain. I messed up the airlines and stuff inside there. But it, it was a wake up at the station. It was bloody loud, I'll tell you that much. And then um, uh, I was flying with uh, Dave Thorne in Mozambique when um, uh, Richard and Bruce Goddard's uh, candle blew up. It, it actually blew up in front of us as, as we were going into strike with the RAR. And um, it, it, it really was um, a bad scene. So 
Dave and myself were there for that. And um, seeing as we weren't supposed to be there, um, all the pieces of the aircraft had, had to be brought out of Muslim, um because they didn't want trophies, basically. So once the nose section was, was located, we put a stick next to that and then um, brought the pilot navigator out, flew them to um, the side of the Zambezi where the Oriole were camped. And after that, we, we, we then left the Oriole on the ground. The whole operation was forgotten, basically. And it was to find any bits of this aircraft. Um, the larger bits, we tied up the rope and put them on the end of, uh, of the cargo swing. And those were, uh, were dropped in the Zambezi along with uh, undercarriage, uh, larger bits that we could take. But all the rest was put in a pile and burnt. Uh, we flew in drums of uh, 100, 130 aviation fuel. And we made this big pile of metal and burnt it. Now, in, in, in the notes, you'll, you'll see I've actually got a, a melt there, which was part of the, the alloy that was melting, was running out of this pile on the ground. And um, it's one of the things I brought back. But um, it's, uh, on this aircraft, it was going in at about 1,000 foot. So there was a lot of wreckage spread around an awful lot of place. And uh, one of the interesting things is we, we got a signal from um, the RAR. And they said, um, Headquarters would like you to locate camera lens with the serial number because it has to be returned. You know, it's, it's absurd. You know, when you're battling to find big bits of aeroplane and they want a, a camera lens returned, you know, because it, it, it wasn't supposed to be there, basically. And then um, as, as, as we were going in for the initial strike um, to drop the, the, the RAR off, um, it, it was, as I said, the whole op had been blown away basically with this, this camera destroying itself and um we dropped these troopies off and went and got more and uh, it was just throw them out and bring as many troops in as we could flying them out of the zambezi and um it turns out that um uh, for the operation they'd flown in um, new recruits for the rar they had new guys in and then these blokes would have to work with an old stick because as i said we were flying five troops at a the time then and um, so throw these guys out, go, go get more and then sort it out. And then we were there for about three days sorting out all this stuff. But every time we flew over the Zambezi, we took a couple of rounds. We could hear these rounds being fired at us. And as you flew back in the evening, these couple of rounds would be fired at you. And then uh, across the river, they had a couple of rounds that came away. So the um, Oreo uh, commanding officer at the time, I forget who it was, he said, We'll sort this guy out. Let's put a couple of uh, 85 mm mortars across there. You know? So they put a couple of mortars across there and that quieted up for a bit. But the next day, there it was. So he said, no, we'll put a stick in and find out what's happening here. So he dropped the stick. And out of the bush came the biggest smiling face I've ever seen in my life. Turned out to be one of these Oriole troopies, brand new guy. As he, he got thrown out of the aircraft, basically, he fell into a hole. And when he sorted himself out, his mates had gone. And with him being a new member on, on their stick, they didn't need, even worry about it because they... Uh, they didn't know him basically and um he worked out where the aircraft were flying and roughly where the camp was so he let loose a couple of rounds every now and then at us so um he, he was actually uh, he was actually awarded by the uh, the co uh, but um just one of those interesting things uh, that happened and um unfortunately in the uh in the same trip with dave thorne and her nice and big there um this was when we lost the two Trojans. And um, it was Dave and myself who actually found uh, the second one. And um, once again, it was exactly the same thing, bring all the bits out. And then um, a, another one where uh, bring the bits out was, um, uh, I think, 75, 76, when the, um, uh, the South Africans pulled out whole as well. They just left everything. And... Um, I was on the, on the squadron and they said, we've got uh, four new people for you. You're going to Matoko because uh, the SA uh, South African Air Force personnel have just pulled out and the whole fire force at Matoka was SA South African personnel. So we um, rolled up there and uh, the, the one tech was the first time we viewed national service techs, uh, anybody um, below the rank of sergeant. And it was Rory Perhat. He was from Eredesia. He was a national serviceman. And, and, and we landed in, in the deck at Matoka, and there were four helicopters there, one K car, three G cars, or Z cars as they called this. And they were in various states of repair, mid-servicing, 
the toolboxes had been left open on the ground, panels left off the aircraft. These guys were just told to get on this aircraft and go, don't leave everything. So we had to um, sort these aircraft out. And these guys had, had basically been shown what Mallory 3 was. So I had to sort these guys out. And at the same time, right on the, on the border, um, the part two stick was taking mortars from the other side. And um, the Lynx driver was, was Starry Stevens. And um, while I was sorting all this lot out to try and get a fire force together and get the aircraft ready, he just went off. He says, I'll go and sort this out myself. And he went ahead of us. Now, I'd flown, I'd, I'd known Starry for a long time from all the FAFs. And um, that's one of the things, as I said before, I, I knew most of the people from way before, even before the squadrons. Then. And um, he, he called up the, the call sign on the ground, worked out where they were, worked out where the water fire was coming from. And uh, as we were on our way by then, and we were flying towards him and we heard him said, I'm turning alive. He said, uh, Roger, opening, um, initiating fire. And he said, uh, I've been hit, guys. He said, uh, oh, shit, I've been hit again. He said, uh, that's it, guys. He says, it's chairs. I'm going in. And he and the links went straight into the ground. And um, it was an ambush. You know, so it was a very well executed ambush. And, and, and by the time that we arrived there, um, they'd got hunter support in. And the hunters had read the hills. So we had to go in and um, drag poor story out of there, plus what was left of his aircraft. Uh, fortunately, he had fired off everything that he had, except for the 303, into the ground. Uh, so we had to get everything of this aircraft out into, um, there was an internal, air fee, uh, internal affairs airfield just inside our side of the, the border. So we had to, had to cargo swing all these bits out and leave them on the end of the runway. So that's another one of those sad ones. Huh? But um, as I say, we brand new guys that they'd never seen action before and they'd never seen these aircraft before. And where we went, as you say, you, you make a plan, you know, you have to get these things going. Huh? So he was uh, killed? Yes, yes. Um, it, it was a very sad day. And, um, you know, you, as, as I said, you were, you were sitting on the veranda of, the, of, of Matake when we were there, and, uh, and then he was gone. You know? But um, the, the, the guys on, on, on Force Squadron, as I used to fly in, in, in Provost from the airfields, going jollies and have you, I knew them. And um, all the uh, Seven Squadron pilots, most of them uh, graduated from, uh, from Force Squadron. Um, Planks Blythewood and Steve Goldwell and Dave Rowe and um, the most famous one is good old Coggy Benica. You know? And um, he was amazing, that guy. We were sitting um, in the old um, Fire Force uh, digs at Mount Darby, you know, when we were on the f football field next to the Saluska Fort and over f f from the jock. And, and that only just opened the runway, so we hadn't moved up there. And um, old Cocky had been out on, on wrecking and he was on finals, on long finals, and went over the runway. And he called finals and he said, hey, shit, guys. He said, I've just flown over a camp and it's occupied. And, and, and this is on the end of the runway. He said, I'm going to do a roller. And I'm going to go well, very quietly off the other end of the runway. He said, you guys get ready. And I'll, when you're ready, I'll come around and initiate the slot. So we just jumped in. No briefing, no nothing. Everybody just on the road. The way we went, turned a big circle and, and, and we followed him in. And there was a hell of a punch up game. And there were lots of these gooks on there, these, these uh, opposition on the end of the way. And uh, um, uh, Ray Fitzpatrick was uh, in, in uh, South African Cape Town. And uh, he, he took a round straight through the foot. And that uh, rendered him unserviceable. So um, Dave Thorne, I was following at the time, spoke to him and said, do a roller landing on the main Darwin runway, which um, if you have tail rotor failure on, um, on, on an, an alloy tree, um, which is your main torque and direction control is your tail rotor. If you uh, have tail rotor failure, you can do a conventional aircraft type landing, but it's very dicey because you have to start a long way out. You've got to line yourself up, get all your ducks in a row. And as you fly forward, you um, gently reduce the power that you're flying forward, but you keep flying forward. And the, uh, and, and the weather cocking effect of the tail rotor um, boom itself, plus the two little uh, winglets on, on, on the tail plane. You've seen that on the LOH, you've got the two little flat uh, tail surfaces, plus the disc of the rotor itself acts as a, as, as a weather cock. And what you do is you, you fly in towards the runway and you slowly, slowly reduce power and, 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 and reduce speed. And the, um, and, and, and the wind takes over as, as, as a weathercocking device that um, 
keeps you straight basically and, and if you can land um yes you land fairly fast about 30 knots and and you slam on the brakes immediately and and at the same time you you switch off the motor and the torque doesn't pull the tail around so he landed we landed right behind him they switched off and i ran ran up to ray he idled back on the blades i picked him up out of the um, the front of the aircraft and Dave Thorne just ran forward, got in the aircraft, and away he went and, and finished the fight. By well, then, the Land Rover had pulled up. We put Ray in that. He went to the Army um, base to get uh, sorted out. And I, I got the aircraft off the runway. And uh, you know, just, just another one of those. Um, as I said, he was an amazing pilot before he swept there. And um, yeah, well, away we went. Another punch up, right? On. But um, talking about that. Um, our LZ in, in Darwin. I, th I think you've been there many times, yes. Um, that's where the uh, um, RLI camp next to us on the football field. And Yeah, yeah, I've, I've been there many times. I know it well, yeah. This is one of the, the smartest fire forces I've ever been on in my life was when two RLI commandos were changing over at Darwin. And um, to the uh, I forget who they were. You know, just, there's, there's so many of them that, that you forget. But the, the outgoing commando had all their RLs pulled up on the one side of the road, pointing out of Mount Darwin, and the other commander pulled in and lined up on the other side of the road. And everybody was in their best jungle green and brown, stable belts, shiny boots, berets. And everybody, some of them were happy to be going home, and the other guys were happy that they were back. And then the siren went off. And the, and then the punch up wasn't very far away. So the guys just grabbed their women, and the punch up was on. Everybody went in, both commanders went in. And as I say, it was a hell of a punch up. And uh, by the end of the evening, it was too late for the uh, outgoing commander to leave. And uh, unfortunately, a young heifer had uh, wandered into the battleground and had to be airlifted back for the bright face, you know. So it was <laughs> another party that night. Yeah, but, but the smartest guys you've ever seen, they were very smart when they went out, but they, they were not looking too good coming back, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember 75, uh, guys like Pete Simmons, and uh, you, must, you must have been there in 74, 75. Oh, it definitely is. Uh, Jock Darwin, yeah. Yeah, well, I was flying out there with um, uh, John Blythewood on, on my plunker. And um, I didn't fly with him uh, very often because him being a rugby player and built on large proportions. And as I say, I'm uh, fairly plump, five, five foot 14. And, 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 and the two of us in one aircraft, there wasn't much payload. So yeah. it, 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 it wasn't very often that... that that we actually flew together. I normally flew with Dave uh, Thorne, Dave Rowe, uh, Steve Caldwell, Todd Litson, because they were uh, um, smaller guys, basically. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it made up, up, up the payload. You know? And um, we went to a, um, an RAR um, contact uh, uh, east of Darwin. And um, Major Dumpy Adams, it was his mob. And um, so we got called into a Kazakh. Because they'd had um, they'd been patrolling and, and they were ambushed and they had a RAO um, troopy. He got wounded, so we went in and um, the, the stretcher we used was um, a small aluminium folding stretcher that would collapse inwards and fold double, so you could put it on your arm basically. So we landed and the uh, RAO troopy was there waiting for us, and he said he's this way. So I, so John said follow him. So I unplugged my helmet. And I ran in after this guy. And um, all of a sudden, my Elowet 3 just lifted off and flew away because um, two of the opposition had just lifted up out of the bush almost right next to JR and started shooting, you know, planks. So he just left. And there I was on the ground with this RAR troopy. And I didn't have any, in, any arms. I didn't have a sidearm. I'd, um, with the, uh, the stretcher and um, moving this guy around, you couldn't lug an FN with you. you know, so... So they're always in the middle of this battleground with nothing, basically. But, but fortunately, the, the troop had been, had been wounded. I, I, I got hold of his FN. So at least I, I had some, some sort of defense there. Oh, yeah. And um, it was the first, one of the few first few times how the KCO had been used. And I think John Britton was in a KCO. And uh, they came over and sorted out this problem. And, uh, and then planks came back in and, and, and got me, fortunately. And we flew this guy to Bandura. And um, as we were flying um, back, we got a call for a, a second Kazakh. It's the same location. So Plank said we'd take it because we know where it is. 
and we flew in and Major Adams had been hit. And um, I was fairly new on, on the squadron then and I didn't know much and he was very badly wounded. And um, I basically held his hand all, all the way to uh, Bendura and, uh, and and he died on the way. So, sure. you know, it's just um, it's one of those things. And then um, I made two resolutions then. Um, the one was I always to have a sidearm, so I got a Browning pistol, and uh, some comrade uh, commissioner donated me his uh, le um, leather holster from that Tokarov pistol, which I used to use. It fitted it beautifully, you know. And um, I, I then decided I'd teach myself as much about um, uh, um, uh, medical stuff and, and battle trauma as I could. And yeah. I was actually one of the first um, techs from Seven Squadron that did a, a troop medics course. I went right. down to um, uh, Llewellyn and did a troop medic. Uh, Dave Jenke, he did one after me as well, but we're the only two that yeah. have done it. So, and yeah. I used to fly around with this. Um, it, it was a bit of an oxymoron, really, because there you're in, in a K car with this um, machine to deal death and a, and, and a big medic bag. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. 